So this is what the star explodes near the Earth. Let's it. What would happen if a star exploded near the Earth? Well, the nearest star to Earth, of course, is the Sun, and it is not going to explode. But if it had eight times the mass, then it would go supernova at the end of its life. So what would that look like? Well, as noted by XKCD, if you held up a hydrogen bomb right to your eyeball and detonated it, uh -huh. that explosion would still be a billion times less bright than watching the sun go supernova from Earth. Yeah, you will be That's how there. insanely powerful supernova explosions are. They are the biggest explosions in the universe. When we see supernovae in other galaxies, yeah, they are see brighter it, than the combined light of hundreds of billions of stars. So bright, in fact, that they appear to come out of nowhere. On the 8th of October, 1604, the astronomer Johannes Kepler looked up into the night sky and noticed a bright star he had never seen before. Yeah, it was Venus. brighter than all the other stars in the sky and about as bright as the planet Jupiter. On moonless nights, it was bright enough to cast a shadow. Kepler yeah, published his observations of this star in a book called De Stella Nova, which means about a new star in Latin. Okay, star. Kepler thought he was witnessing the birth of a new star, but it was actually a star's violent death. Over the following year and a half, the light faded until it was no longer visible. But the name stuck. Even once we learned what was really happening in the 1930s, the violent final explosion for stars between about 8 and 30 solar masses has been called a supernova. But how exactly a star explodes is not what most people think. For most of a star's life, it exists in a stable balance. In its core, it fuses lighter elements together to make heavier ones. And in the process, it converts a small amount of matter into energy. This energy is really what keeps the star from collapsing in on itself. Gravity compresses the star, but that force is counteracted by the pressure generated by the movement of particles inside the star, and by the pressure of photons released by fusion. So, in effect, stars are propped up by their own light. If the rate of fusion drops at the center of the star, the temperature and the pressure decrease. Gravity starts winning, compressing the star. But this increases the temperature and pressure in the core, mm. which increases the rate of fusion. Mm, to explore. It's a stable, self-regulating system. But there's a problem. Stars have a finite amount of fuel, which over time gets used up. Our sun is about 5 billion years into its 10 billion year lifespan. There are stars dozens yes. of times more massive yes, than the sun. Okay which you would think would live much longer. But they actually use up their nuclear fuel faster. A star 20 times the mass of our sun has a lifespan of just 10 million years. And more massive stars burn hotter and even brighter, but for much shorter lives. For 90% the life of a star, okay. the core is only hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium. And when the hydrogen runs out, fusion slows, gravity compresses the core, and its temperature increases to 200 million degrees, at which point helium fuses yes, into carbon. Imagine There's enough helium to power the star for around a million years, but as the helium runs out, the core is again compressed and heated. Carbon starts fusing into neon, which lasts about a thousand years, and then neon fuses into oxygen for a few more years, then it's oxygen to man. silicon for Jeez. a few months, and at 2.5 billion degrees, silicon fuses into nickel, which yes. decays into iron. Now, at the heart of this giant Even star, iron. there is an iron core building that's only a few thousand kilometers across. Iron is where this pattern stops. Instead of liberating energy as it fuses into heavier elements, it actually requires energy. Iron is the most stable element, so it actually takes energy both to fuse it into heavier elements and to break it down into lighter ones. Both fusion and fission reactions ultimately end up at iron. The iron core grows, but the crush of gravity becomes greater and greater as the rate of fusion drops. 
When the iron core is about 1.4 times the mass of our sun, which is known as the Chandrasekhar limit, the pull of gravity is so strong that something totally wild happens. Quantum mechanics takes over. Electrons run out of room to move and they're forced into their lowest energy states. They then become absorbed by the protons in the nucleus. In this process, the protons turn into neutrons and release neutrinos. With the electrons gone, the core collapses and fast at about 25% the speed of light. So what used to be a ball of iron 3000 kilometers in diameter becomes a ball of neutrons just 30 kilometers across. Essentially, it's a neutron star. With no outward pressure to hold it up, the rest of the star caves in, also falling at a quarter the speed of light. It hits the neutron star and bounces off, creating a huge pressure wave. But this kinetic energy isn't quite enough to start a supernova explosion. No, the thing that really kicks it off is the humble neutrino. Now, I normally think of neutrinos neutrino. as particles that do basically nothing. I mean, they interact so rarely with matter that right now, there are a hundred trillion neutrinos passing through your body per second. It would take a okay. light year of lead just to give you a 50-50 chance of stopping a neutrino. And that's because they interact only through gravity and the weak force. But in a supernova, when the electrons are captured by the protons, an unbelievable number of neutrinos is released, around 10 to the 58. You would think they would just fly off at nearly the speed of light, but the core of a supernova is incredibly dense, about 10 trillion times more dense than lead. And as a result, it traps some of those neutrinos and captures their energy. And this is what makes a star go supernova. A particle that is millions of times less massive than an electron, that barely interacts with anything, is responsible for some of the largest explosions in the universe. In that explosion, only Brilliant. a hundredth of 1% of the energy is released as electromagnetic radiation, the light that we can see. Even then, supernova have enough energy to outshine a whole galaxy. About 1% of the energy is released as the kinetic energy of the exploding matter, but the vast majority of the energy is released in the form of neutrinos. And neutrinos are actually the first signal we detect from supernovae. And that's because after they're generated in the core, they can escape before the shock wave reaches the surface, where the light that we see is generated. So neutrinos can arrive on Earth hours before the photons, giving astronomers a chance to aim their telescopes at the right part of the sky. I actually used to work at a neutrino observatory back in college, and I would work the graveyard shift yeah. between midnight you and could. 8 a.m. So if I detected a really big increase in the neutrino flux during my shift, it was my job to call and wake up scientists so they could go look out for a supernova. Now that never yeah, actually happened, but we did okay. have some close calls. Now I need to clarify a couple things. First, not all really massive stars explode. As they collapse, some form black holes instead, which means they do not go supernova. And second, What's there's another way to make a supernova. Sometimes a white dwarf star, which is incredibly dense, pulls matter off a nearby star. And when its mass reaches that Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses, the white dwarf collapses, creating a supernova. This is actually the type of supernova that Kepler saw in 1604, a supernova 20,000 light years from Earth. Now, because the shocks are asymmetric, supernova explain neutron stars that can move really fast. There's a neutron star we've observed with a velocity of 1,600 kilometers per second. And we think that was caused by a very asymmetric supernova explosion, sent it shooting off in the other direction. Despite only recently learning about how supernovae work, humans have been observing them for thousands of years. Ancient Indian, Chinese, Arabic, and European astronomers all observed supernovae. But they are quite rare. In a galaxy like our Milky Way, consisting of a hundred billion stars, there are only about one or two supernovae per century. A particularly amazing example is the supernova of 1054, when the light of a supernova 6,500 light years away reached the Earth 
and was recorded by Chinese astronomers. If we look to where that supernova was recorded, we see the Crab mm, Nebula. It is a giant remnant of radioactive matter left behind by the explosion. In the thousand years since the explosion, the remnant has grown to 11 light years in diameter. Supernovas produce a lot of cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are actually particles, mainly protons and helium nuclei, and they travel out at very, very nearly the speed of light. They have a tremendous amount of energy. So at what distance could a supernova cause problems for life on Earth? The closest stars to us, besides the Sun, are the three stars in Alpha Centauri. They are 4.4 light years away. But stars do move around, and on average, a star gets within one light year of Earth every 500,000 years. So what would happen if such a star went off? Yeah, so within a light year, you're easily within a danger distance from just the kinetic energy. So I, th I think even at that distance, you're, you're looking at possibly blowing the atmosphere off. But we would also have other problems to worry about. Supernovae create conditions that are hot enough to fuse elements heavier than iron. In the months after the explosion, these elements undergo radioactive decay, producing gamma rays and cosmic rays. Uh -oh. Less than 0.1% of the Not energy the produced by a supernova is emitted as gamma rays from these radioactive decays. But even this tiny percentage can be dangerous. At a few light years from a supernova, the radiation could be deadly, though most of it would be blocked by our atmosphere. Now, the Earth right. is What's protected from solar and cosmic radiation by our atmosphere, and specifically by ozone molecules, three oxygen okay. atoms bonded together. But high-energy cosmic rays from supernovae can come down and break apart nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere. And then these bond with oxygen atoms, which can then break apart ozone. And so we can lose okay. a lot of our ozone if there's too many cosmic rays Damn, coming from supernova sense. events. And that can expose us to all kinds of dangerous radiation coming in from space. We actually see an increase in atmospheric NO3 concentrations coinciding with supernova explosions. A supernova yeah, within 30 light outside. years is rare, only happening maybe once every one and a half billion years or so. But a recent article suggests supernovae could be lethal all the way out to 150 light years away, and so those would be much more common. We actually have evidence for a supernova that went off 150 light years from Earth 2.6 million years ago. It would have been seen by our early human ancestors, like Australopithecus. And we know this because there are elements present on Earth that could only have been deposited by a recent supernova. In sedimentary rocks at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, scientists have found traces of iron 60 in a yeah. layer that was deposited 2.6 million years ago. Iron 60 is an isotope of iron with four more neutrons than the most common type of iron. Iron 60 it's is really supernova. hard to make. Our sun doesn't make it, nor is it produced basically anywhere else in the solar system. Iron 60 is made basically exclusively in supernova explosions. And Iron 60 is radioactive. It has a half-life of 2.6 million years. So every 2.6 million years, half of the sample decays into cobalt 60. So all of the iron 60 that was around during the formation of the Earth four and a half billion years ago has definitely decayed. So the iron 60 that the scientists measure is proof of a recent supernova. Scientists also measured trace amounts of manganese 53 in the same sediments, giving further evidence supporting the idea that recently there was an explosion of a nearby supernova. The supernova that happened 2.6 million years ago wasn't catastrophic for our ancestors. But some researchers hypothesize that it could be related to the mass extinction which is seen at the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary in the fossil record around the same time. Yes, this extinction advice. wiped out around yes, a third of season. marine megafauna. The idea is that the cosmic rays from the supernova hit particles in our atmosphere, creating muons, which are charged particles like the electron, only more than 200 times heavier. The muon flux for years after the supernova would have been 150 times higher than normal. And the bigger the animal, the larger the radiation dose it would have yeah. received from these muons, which is why megafauna were so disproportionately affected. 
And what's more, Auto theta compared to the ones that lived at depth, where the water would have protected them from muons. A further evidence for these recent nearby supernovae comes from our place in the galaxy. You know, if you look in the space between the stars in our galaxy, on average there are around a million hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. That may sound like a lot, but it's basically a perfect vacuum. But for hundreds of light years in all directions around our solar system, you find there are a thousand times fewer hydrogen atoms. It's like they've all been blown out somewhere, and our solar system is existing in this cosmic void inside a low-density bubble. So that is evidence for maybe tens of supernovae that would have blown all this material outwards. But there are cosmic explosions that are even more deadly than normal supernovae. Gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts were discovered by the Vela satellites, which were looking for Soviet nuclear tests. But on the 2nd of July 1967, the satellites detected a large burst of gamma rays, which were coming from space. There are two main sources of gamma ray bursts, mergers of neutron stars and the core collapses of gigantic stars called hypernovae. Hypernovae are caused by stars that are at least 30 solar masses and rapidly spinning. Their collapse leads to an explosion 10 times more powerful than a regular supernova, and it leaves behind a black hole. The gamma ray bursts caused by hypernovae channel most of their energy into beams which are just a few degrees across. If there was a gamma ray burst within 6,000 light years, it would decrease the ozone level enough that it could be catastrophic. To put this distance in context, a sphere with a radius of 6,000 light years contains hundreds of millions of stars. On October 9th, 2022, astronomers detected one of the most powerful gamma ray bursts ever measured. It was powerful enough to measurably affect how the ionosphere bounces radio waves. The effect on the ionosphere was around the same as a solar flare. But this gamma ray burst was located in a galaxy two and a half billion light years away. Hmm. Astronomers speculate that a gamma ray burst could have caused the late Ordovician mass extinction, which wiped out 85% of marine species 440 million years ago. There is no direct evidence, but gamma ray bursts are common enough that it is estimated hmm. that there has been a 50% chance that there was an ozone removing extinction causing GRB in the vicinity of Earth in the last yes, 500 uh, million years. Bands. So if a supernova or a gamma ray burst were to go off near the Earth now, that would be pretty catastrophic. But in an ironic twist, we kind of owe our existence to these sorts of explosions. Because 4.6 billion years ago, it was probably the shockwave from a nearby supernova which triggered the collapse of a cloud of gas and dust that gradually coalesced to form our solar system. So the sun, the earth, and all of us wouldn't be here today without the explosions of nearby stars. Okay. And everything has to be lined up to create life in the exact moment, in the exact time. This would be crazy to think about. I mean, below the analysis too.